Uh, thank you, Zoe. Uh, thanks. And yes, as Zoe mentioned, we are at the final panel of today's Data Institutions event. And what a fascinating event it has been. Um, this panel, as Zoe said, is all about data access uh, uh, to help us with COVID-19. And yeah, I mean, COVID-19 is the thing that we've been talking about pretty much all of us for most of this year. We've been talking about it, thinking about it, worrying about it, uh, trying to assess how it's going to impact our own individual lives and the lives of our family, friends and colleagues, let alone society. But we're at a data event, so let's not get into the emotional uh, nitty gritty of this. Let's think about how data is critical to this, uh, to this issue and the practicalities of how access to data can help us address this completely unique situation that we all find ourselves in. Access to data, as we've learned over the course of this event today, is critical, but in a time of crisis, it's, it's vital as well, because it helps us make informed decisions that can have profound impacts, as I say, on, in, on individuals, on groups, on organisations and on society as a whole. But how is data access shared and used to make decisions in a time of crisis? And how can a data institution help facilitate that process? I'm completely thrilled to have three fascinating people doing fascinating work joining me today for, for this discussion. Uh, uh, they're going to be talking to us about the public sector health perspective, the private sector perspective and a civil society perspective. Uh, so let me introduce the panel to you. We have Tom Denwood, uh, Director of Research and Clinical Trials at NHS Digital. Caroline Gorski, Group Director of R Squared Data Labs at Rolls-Royce and Chair of the Emergent Alliance, and Carly Kind, Director of the Ada Lovelace Institute. I'm going to crack straight on because there's an awful lot for us to talk about, and I'm going to go to you first, Tom, if I may, with a very, very general question to give you opportunity to tell us about all your exciting work. But first of all, you know, working at NHS Digital, you really were at the cutting edge of this COVID-19 crisis and all eyes were on you. So can you tell us a little bit more about your experiences in collecting, accessing and sharing data to help address the challenges faced by this unique crisis? Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, of course, and good afternoon. Uh, just kind of a bit of orientation, NHS Digital, we're the data and technology partner for the NHS in England, and we're mainly funded by the Department of Health and Social Care. So we're a government data institution. And our response to COVID was kind of twofold, one, a direct care response, and the other a data response. On the direct care response, uh, you know, very immediately, we had to roll out a COVID algorithm for the 111 call center. So if you had to call 111, you could go through a sequence to identify whether you had COVID or not. And we rolled that out to the 111 online web tool uh we and all of these things that feels like a blur because it'll kind of happen back in april so i had to remind myself of, of what we did uh we also had to update the content on the nhs.uk website and the nhs app and help put in infrastructure in the nightingale hospitals and some additional infrastructure for the new testing labs but that's kind of the, the stuff we did almost to, to meet the, the direct care response very very quickly the asks for data you know, came in shortly thereafter but we had to collect link and provide access to data quicker more data quicker than we ever had before so just to give a bit of a, a flavor to that uh, we started collecting covid test data which test result data which we didn't imagine we would need to collect kind of six months previous we had to collect intensive care data because obviously during the the, the peak of the pandemic the number, number of citizens in intensive care we had to collect well we had to work and respond to the gp profession who asked us to reduce the burden on individual GP practices by collecting the coded element of the GP record and then make use and utility of that. So we then had to uh, link those in, in, in record time and then provide very, very quick access for purposes such as the shielding list. So we had a team who pretty much worked nonstop for 48 hours uh, at the request of the Chief Medical Officer to create the shielding list of what ended up being 2.2 million citizens. So it could be used for, for the purposes which you're, you're very familiar with from the, from the press uh, to create prevalence dashboards so citizens could understand the prevalence of COVID in their, in their, in their region and then provide data in, for cutting edge research. So most importantly, the recovery trial, which you'll have seen in the press, which identified that dexamethasone is an effective treatment for patients in intensive care with COVID. And also that Donald Trump's hydroxychloroquine doesn't appear to be an effective 
treatment for those in intensive care with with COVID. So yeah, that, that that's an example of the response kind of collecting more, storing, linking, providing access. But I guess it's really important that we didn't drop the rigor at all during the process. So yeah, uh, individuals or parties wanting access to data, we still had a very very rigorous process to provide access to that data, and we almost had you know, three locks, uh, three keys on the lock. So we had our Caldecott guardian, our senior information risk owner and an executive for our organisation each approve one of the data releases so they can then together evaluate whether it's appropriate or not. And, and on occasion they did that uh, if it's yeah, with independent advice. So that, hopefully that gives you a flavour of, of some of the things we've, we've been up to. I think there's also a personal aspect as well. So to me, Easter was a blur. <laughs> like many of the team, we kind of worked work straight through for probably about three weeks nonstop and then we could start getting you know, little half days here and there. But so it's, it, it was a great team effort, but not just within NHS Digital, because there are other data institutions, Public Health England, NHS England, and obviously the data institutions had to pull together to make sure we could respond as a health and care system and not just as individual organisations. So. That's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the speedy overview. Um, Caroline, I'm, I'm going to come to you uh, and, and look at things from a private sector perspective. So since the start of the pandemic, you've been collaborating with a, a wide range of organisations to create access to data um, that may may have been data that hasn't previously been shared or made accessible before. Could you talk us through how this happened at such speed and, and, and the, 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 the complexities, but also the opportunities and the delights, hopefully, of, of this process and where you see things going in the future? Yes, thank you, Renata, and, and uh, great to hear uh, about the, the work that's been happening in the in the healthcare space um, in response to the crisis. Um, the Emergent Alliance was born uh, out of um, interest expressed by my team, R Squared Data Labs, which is Rolls Royce's data science and data innovation capability around the world. Um, essentially, you may remember that uh, back in, in March, the UK government put a call out to UK manufacturers to ask them to collaborate around trying to um, look at uh, the ventilator challenge that we face in the UK, where the supply of ventilators to adequately meet the, the predicted demand. Um, in intensive care wasn't uh, considered to be um, adequate and, and the government wanted a number of, of UK manufacturing organisations to come together to collaborate around trying to uh, both come up with new ventilator designs but also to uh, reposition their supply chains and their manufacturing sites to be able to produce ventilators to existing specifications and Rolls-Royce was one of the manufacturing companies that responded to that challenge. Um, what was interesting, though, was my team, who are data scientists who work with data and are therefore, you know, really rather more in the abstracted world of, of bits and bytes and numbers, came to me and said, what can we do to respond to this challenge as well? Um, Rolls-Royce has more than 30 years of history of working uh, with advanced data in predictive uh, uh, scenarios looking at very faint um, and emerging data signals that come out of highly complex streams of data um, on our power generation units as they're being used whether that's in aviation or in rail or, or in static power generation um, and we use that capability to be able to understand um, faint signals that um, quite often are showing entirely new behaviours emerging from data. So we're not necessarily pattern matching for things that have happened before. We're predicting and looking for completely new outcomes. And my data scientist community said, can't we use that capability to look at a broader set of data around economic recovery and the potential green shoots, if you like, that we might start to see emerging from this crisis that we could then use to help uh, nation states to help local governments, to help large businesses, to help small businesses, and maybe also even to help private individuals to start to see where economic recovery is happening and to build confidence and, um, and a measured and balanced approach to uh, being able to re-stimulate the economy whilst at the same time taking on board the risks associated with the spread of the pandemic. Um, we launched that in April um, with a founding community which includes uh, IBM, Microsoft uh, Leader, which is the Leeds Institute for Data Analytics, uh, the ODI, um, Truata, which is the Data Anonymization Organization, uh, and Rolls Royce. And we now have a community of more than 60 um, private sector organizations collaborating, bringing data, um, bringing data challenges, uh, questions that they want to have addressed that are about economic recovery. And we also have uh, several hundred uh, citizen data scientists working in that community um, or citizen operators working in that community, helping us to, to think about 
how we can develop tools and analytics that will help us to respond faster to economic uh, recovery options. Fabulous. Uh, uh... You've all had such a bonkers year by the sounds of things. Uh, uh, I hope this is a moment for you to catch your breath and, and, and think back on the things that you've achieved and, uh, uh, and remark at how wonderful it's all, all, all been. Um, come to you, Carly. Um, I'm looking for a civil society perspective from you, and I'm aware that uh, Ada Lovelace have done an awful lot of work speaking with people who are obviously integral to this entire data ecosystem around COVID-19. I mean, obviously, it's we, we as individuals uh, and groups, we're the ones that are, are getting sick. So from a civil society, society perspective, do you think that, um, that we've been clear on what our data role is and how access to data about us is, is, is critical? Uh, um, and do you, do you think that the approach that's been taken um, has been has proven to educate people? Has it worked well or, or are there still, is there still a lot of room for improvement to be made? You probably have some good and poor examples that you could share with us, please. Sure. Thanks, Renata. Thank you for having me. Um, so the Ada Lovelace Institute, for those of you who don't know us, is a research institute with a remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And that means we're interested in what the societal impacts and ethical questions are when it comes to data and AI. Um, around COVID, we've focused on talking to members of the public about their response to COVID tech specifically. So we're really interested in um, some of the apps that were being developed uh, to process uh, personal data, symptom data around COVID, so symptom tracking apps and um, and contact tracing. But I think that the lessons we've learned and the studies we've done there are um, generalizable for data more broadly used within the ecosystem around COVID, particularly personal data. I think that our interest has really been how the public feels about personal and health data being shared rather than non-personal operational data, which I think people are much more comfortable with for, for obvious reasons reasons. Um, I think that, um, first of all, it's important to say that I think broadly speaking, and this is based on online public deliberation exercises that we've done with members of the public throughout the pandemic, people have not um, taken an approach which says privacy versus the pandemic. There's not been a sense that we should pit our individual rights against uh, the pandemic and that there has to be a all or nothing choice there. I think people have been very open and willing to the idea of data sharing, data access and how critical that can be to responding to this pandemic. And I think, you know, people were People have been excited by that the, the possibilities there. Um, so for sure, there hasn't been a kind of knee-jerk reaction to um, efforts to share and open up data, um, and you know, in, interventions under the COPE regulations and others. I think have all been received relatively well. I think broadly speaking, the starting point for most members of the public was if data can be used to help to respond this, to this crisis, it absolutely should be. Um, but I think that that doesn't come without its caveats. And it and again, I think it's not been an absolute um, kind of rejection or acceptance, but I think it's been a cautious acceptance with caveats to data use and data access. And um, I think that reflects probably the, the level of data literacy that is prevalent among the population now. I think people are, understand more and more um, how anonymization works, for example, or um, that you can have data minimization or other types of principles that are becoming more mainstream um, in our society. So when we spoke to members of the public about the conditions on which they would be comfortable with different COVID technologies using their data, for example, for contact tracing or symptom tracking apps, we found that they, um, they've, they've zeroed in on, on a number of issues. When it came to data, they were very happy to hand over their data but they wanted clarity around the data use. So they wanted um, guarantees that data would only be used in um, identifiable form in the short term and not the long term. That was quite an important aspect, the, the kind of timeliness of it and the need not to uh, see intrusions into um, normal kind of normally acceptable privacy provisions outlast the pandemic for a long period of time. That was something that came up quite a lot in um, in our public deliberation. Um, we saw people saying that they'd want to see the bare minimum of data collected and not too much data collected. Um, and they all distinguished on the basis of anonymized versus personal or medical data. Um, and, I, and I think the other thing that came up in the context of data use was 
uh, the members of public with which we engaged, they wanted to know who in the system was using the data and the um, that, that had a bearing on trustworthiness. So people tended to look at uh, COVID tech or use of data in the context of a crisis as part of a system and they judged the trustworthiness of the system as a whole, not just the particular application. And so we could see trustworthiness track to uh, events that were otherwise happening in the media um, that might have had a, in, um, a bearing on trustworthiness, people that, that impacted their feeling on the use of data um, at the same time. So those are some of the takeaways that we took from public deliberation and, and a couple of the others outside of data use, just in case you're interested, was the need for transparency and the need for a transparent evidence base around the use of data in tech, um, the need for independent assessment and review of technology. Um, and importantly, I think, is the real attention to questions of solidarity. People wanted to know, are we in this together? Is this something that everybody will benefit from. So an attention to vulnerable groups and whether they're also benefiting from data or technology initiatives as part of COVID. And I think that's quite an interesting finding in the context of this crisis that people recognise that these type, th this pandemic has had disparate impacts on, dis on different communities and they want to see interventions benefiting vulnerable communities as much as they benefit themselves. That's a kind of whistle stop tour of some of our findings. It's it's absolutely fascinating and, and, and it's interesting that you speak so much about trust. Uh, uh, I mean, across the board, we're, we're talking here about sensitive uh, medical data, uh, but also government data. We're talking about sensitive, potentially uh, restricted business private sector data, and we're then talking about individuals' personal data. Now, to be able to share or provide access or to even start to collaborate, particularly in the form of like a data institution, methods of governance, etc., trust is absolutely integral. So I wondered if, uh, if any of you wanted to um, pick up on that, how, you, how you've had the conversation about trust, how you're developing trust, and, and really, how complicated is it? Tom, you've got your hand up. Um, please, I, I will start with you. Sure. I mean, trustworthiness is so important when it relates to people's medical records. And yeah, there, there's lots of components to, to trustworthiness. Uh, but I think ultimately it's about the right behaviours and the right intents. And yeah, there, there's the, the kind of fundamentals of compliance. So you know, be assured that NHS Digital apps you operated within the COPE regs and the two legal directions we were issued with to, to respond to COVID. Uh, it's about ethically doing doing the right thing. And on occasion, we came into a little bit of tension because uh, people wanted the data straight away. And we said, well, actually, no, we've got an independent group which advises us on releasing data, which is made up of lay people, ethicists, uh, subject matter experts. And actually, let's just give us 28, uh, 24, 48 hours further so we can get their advice to influence uh, maybe the, the way we release the data. Uh, and we are very, very heavily drawing on their advice. And we had to be very engaging. So on some of the bigger kind of data movements during COVID, uh, within a very compressed time scale, we had to have dialogue with the National Data Guardian for Health and Care. We had to have dialogue with Health Watch, and we had to have dialogue with the Information Commissioner's Office. And, and we had to kind of use those partners as sometimes as a proxy for a wider public dialogue because we didn't have time. But actually engaging with those parties to kind of give us the best view we could and to shape what, what we do was felt, felt like the right thing. And again, that's kind of behaviours. And I mentioned the kind of the, the three keys on the lock in terms of data release. And just to give you a little example, uh, we were asked, uh, we framed up on a Saturday actually, to provide data for the convalescent plasma trial. So you might have seen it in the press, but this is for people who've recovered from COVID and who are prepared to give their blood plasma so they can see through a bit of their blood to then infuse back into those in intensive care uh, as, as a potential treatment. And uh, we were asked kind of initially just provide the, provide all the data. And it took us 11 days from inquiry to releasing the data to actually work out that actually they didn't want the data pertaining to children or those shielding or those who might have died in the 28 days after their positive test or those who have maybe uh, registered a national data opt out previously. So although within those 11 days we, we got the ethical advice and we worked through, we were still able to provide the advice at a, at a, at a time schedule which actually worked for the plasma program. So I'll just use this as a, as a brief illustration to demonstrate how even in a moment of pressure, you can have absolute rigour and make you know, sensible decisions uh, to, to build trustworthiness. Thank you. Uh, Caroline, please. Yeah, I think it's um, 
it's very interesting that the 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 the, the, the things that are very similar and can be can be read across between the examples there and, and the examples of thinking about how how private sector organizations share uh, economic economic recovery information and, and then the, also thinking about the things that are different so, so the emergent alliance for the most part does not deal in personally identifiable information or where it does uh, we use anonymization techniques to make sure that that information is 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 you know, is anonymized and can obviously be completely anonymized. Whereas in an example where you're talking about wanting to identify a specific individual who might have the ability to, to make their plasma available, clearly that can't be an anonymized process because you've got to actually, you know, pinpoint who they are. Um, so those I think are, are quite different. I think where the 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 the, the challenges uh, or the or there is read across that's the same though is is that for us i've been looking at questions of data sharing in 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 private sector contexts across corporates for probably about two decades now and i have never seen the degree of movement and traction and achievement of progress that i have seen in the last six months and that's fundamentally because operating in this crisis and being in a position where everybody can see that the economic ramifications of what we're going through are you know profoundly significant means that they understand that there's there's a there's a reason to get over the the hesitations that they might have had commercially previously around i'm not sure how much my data is worth i don't want to make it available for others to to collaborate around and share with because if i undervalue it then i will lose out on transactional value and if i overvalue it then i will have you know betrayed my my ignorance of how much my data is worth in the market um, and that that those kind of commercial questions about the transactional value of data from from private sector organizations have been holding back except in a, a small number of instances um more profound data collaboration you know over the last 20 years and and this opportunity has given us a chance to challenge those sacred cows and to just acknowledge that the scale of the problem is so large that the only way we can solve it is by coming together Carly, um, I, I mean, you started the, the points about trust and we, we've had a specific question that I think expands on that, that I'd like to ask you in this context. Um, we've been asked, the, the public were happy to share some data for the period of the pandemic, uh, but felt that it should be short term. So how likely do we really think oh, that is to happen or are some of these changes now here to stay? And in terms of developing trust and then coming back to the, some of the points that uh, uh, Tom's made about you know, governance and so on and the three, the three key lock, how can we communicate that better? How can that be communicated better to the general public? It's a really good question. I think it, um, one might need more subject matter expertise in the health domain than I have to answer it. I suspect the answer from the health domain is that, that there have been advancements made in terms of data sharing, data access throughout this pandemic that should not be rolled back because they have, the pandemic has incentivized data sharing and data access that should have happened a long time ago. And, and, and we don't want to see us walk away from that. So um, I know, for example, NHSX have uh, had some success in bringing together imaging around the national chest imaging database for the purpose of COVID um, diagnoses. And they're hoping to build on that going forward and put together a national uh, imaging database that can be accessed for a range of different applications beyond just COVID. So I think the the when it comes to health data, there have been advancements that shouldn't be rolled back. And I think uh, in the context outside of that, there are clearly things that will need to, to end when the pandemic ends or when the crisis ends um, uh, in terms of data sharing, for example, around compliance with regulations on, on movement, et cetera. But I think the key uh, in deciding what should stay and what should go is um, how are we engaging the public on this? How are we communicating about it? And what type of conversation can we have about a new society that we want to build? I think we're all realizing that uh, we don't just, we shouldn't just go back to the old normal just for the sake of it. There is so much that has been gained and won and hard fought during this crisis that can be built upon. And, and the health data example is one of those. Um, and so, and, and equally, I think um, Caroline's examples around private sector data sharing um, within the private sector, but also to, to government, I think, 
those are things that we should not roll back either. There's been immense gains there. And, and I think government's also starting to realize the value of private sector data that is, after all, um, built on the backs of you know, individual citizens. And so well, some of it is anyway. So I think there's been some real um, eyes being open to the prospects and potentialities of data that we don't want to walk away from. But uh, ensuring that it can remain and be built upon with public trust and confidence is going to require a, a really frank and open discussion. Um, and it shouldn't be the case that things just linger, infrastructure just lingers because it's been put there throughout the pandemic, because I think that will ultimately undermine public trust. Absolutely. I, I, I agree. And, and there, there is going to be some form of new normal. We will roll some things back. But what's been fascinating about this and the examples that have been given here today is that data trust, data institution, data governance, data collaboration has happened at, 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 at pace. Uh, uh, you've all, you know, people have all pulled together to, to deal with a crisis. So with that in mind, and obviously with a whole load of lessons that need to be learned and better public engagement or, or continuing good transparency and communication, how can we actually create long-term sustainability of some of the things that have happened during this time of crisis to, 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 to see us through uh, uh, into our new normal where uh, we all have a better understanding of the, the, the power and the use of, of good, good access to data? Um, Caroline, I'll, I'll come to you first, if I may. Yeah, thank you, Renata. I mean, I think um, one of the things that I kind of observe as underpinning not just the work of the Emergent Alliance, but actually quite a lot of the things that we're talking about here, including um, consumers' understanding and, and comfort with, with their information being used for some of the use cases that, that Connie's outlined is, um, I think we have got ourselves, or we have finally seemed to understand that we are we are collectively responsible at an individualistic level now. And I think that is a change in the way that we think about our role as citizens in our society, not just in our country that we live in, but across the world. Um, and, and I think that's actually quite an important shift. It, it, in, it, it creates lots of questions about what it means to have, to have that responsibility, to have that collective responsibility from an individualized position. Um, and I think we need to have conversations that explore that in more detail. And I also think we need to extend those conversations to include corporates understanding their collective responsibility at an individualized corporate level. And if the Emergent Alliance can do anything at all um, beyond its immediate objective of helping to stimulate economic recovery, then I want it to make muscle memory. I want it to make muscle memory in the kinds of private sector organizations who through their operations and through the, the, their economic their, their economic presence in in the world um, have the ability to collaborate and change things and I, I would like the emergent alliance to be a way of of baking that muscle memory in so that the next time we have a crisis of this scale we 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 move faster we are smoother we respond more comprehensively and we can get further with the responses that we can make. And, and Tom, do you, do you have any, we've got just over a minute left. Tom, do you have any thoughts about sustainability of, of uh, sure. uh, the data institution that you've created within NHS Digital, please? Uh, absolutely, very quickly. So I think the, the system needs, needs to maintain the speed of response. We proved we could do it together in a pandemic. We will need that for other pandemics or other health crises. I think the individual data institutions, I think we need to bring some of them together more, maybe even defragment the system to simplify those kind of interface uh, costs and time and uh, pressures. Uh, and I think uh, notwithstanding some of the debate around uh, not holding on to data inappropriately, but I think our collective speed of response could have been more effective had we had some kind of fundamental data sets preloaded in the right secure environments ready for response and HGI UK are working with, as a partner to get that, get that in place ready for a kind of a, a, a second peak. And then finally, transparency has to be retained and all the, the, the trustworthiness, which, uh, which college that's got to be fundamental. Five seconds to go, uh, the end of a fascinating discussion. I want to thank you all for joining us today. And I, and, and I want to say what a, what a brilliant event this has been. And uh, uh, I hope we've all learned a huge amount about data institutions going forward. Thank you ever so much. Uh, uh, and, and now to the final part of today's event. <laughs>